the first time that I realized when I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, that it hit me at age 25, but I had been unknowingly working up to that point, probably from about age 10. When I was, I remember in fourth grade, I used to watch shows like Eight is Enough, which took place in Sacramento, California. And then there was also Three's Company. And I was always California dreaming. And just the idea of this California lifestyle, and it always, it had, there was the sun and the beach and, and that whole thing. And then also connected to that was just movies. And I had a grandma that took me to a lot of movies and that was kind of my biggest influence and in kind of just like getting me hooked into that. And I had gone through, in high school I started getting into acting and did acting in college and was pursuing acting. So I went to a, an MFA program out in, at Cal State Long Beach for a year and was unhappy with it and left that and was still pursuing acting in Los Angeles and finally realized um, through, well first off, that I'm not an actor, like I just don't have, there's other ways that I, I thought it was so difficult to get the opportunity to act that I thought, you know, I'll pick another way to express creativity and I started to work production in and around Hollywood and realized I don't want to do this. So that was like ages 22 to 25. So at 25, I realized, no, I want to be the person that makes the movie. Like, I want to be able to tell the story that I want to tell, the way that I want to tell it. And that was, that launched the whole idea of becoming a, a filmmaker. Um, in terms of individuals that really nurtured my creative side, there's, there's three primary individuals. The first two are my mom and my dad. And I can tell with you all, you're those types of parents. Um, both of them, there was never, you know, myself and my brothers would come up with an idea or something that we wanted to do or achieve and not once in our lives did we ever hear, no, you can't do that. It was always, okay, let's figure out the path to go and achieve that. And even to this day, you know, my parents were just visiting from St. Louis and they stayed with us for two weeks. And in terms of these other projects that I'm working on, they've been my biggest supporters and even through you know those times when it's kind of dark and you're wondering how am i going to pull this off how is this going to happen they're always there to say no this is you know what we were just talking about earlier does anybody care is this worthwhile am i nuts pursuing this and they're always right there on the sidelines saying no stay in there because you're on to something so those two um in terms of nurturing creativity and giving me the support of like outside you know people to support you but also showing me like where to go within to find support they've been my biggest influencers and then the, the other person is my english literature teacher from high school and it was through his classes i was blessed to have him both sophomore and senior years and and it was ap english and he started off both years with um this poem called Curiosity by Alistair Reed. Curiosity may have killed the cat, or more likely the cat was curious to see what death was like, having no reason to go on licking paws and fathering litter upon litter of kittens predictably. And it goes on and it talks about living the life of a cat. And cats are not afraid to die, you know, time and time again because they have nine lives. And that kind of summarizes what he was teaching us, was to ask questions, take chances, take risks, fall and die and get back up. And he, his particular medium was English literature. And it just opened up these ideas and pretty much the big idea of, wow, you know, this is, this thing called life is such a rich experience with questions and pain and happiness and you know the kind of just speaking to the whole kind of human spectrum and the teachings and just spending time with him um, for two years you know every day for English literature just I felt like had a, played a major influence on me and kind of infused into my my operating system 
the reason why I'm so attracted to the medium is because within that, that medium seems to incorporate and encompass so many other mediums. So you have writing and storytelling, you have photography slash cinematography, you have art direction, you, it's a collaborative process. I love the collaborative process. And I think ultimately that's the thing that attracts me the most is, and that's why I like, I realized, no, I want to direct my, my, my own films. So the idea of having this vision and all aligning and choreographing all these different people who are experts in each of their own trades or specific areas. And that's what's so great about directing is I think it's, for me, it's the most fun. You, you get to work with experts in every one of these categories or departments and here's the vision and here's your assignment here's what i you know here's how i see how you you know or your department fits in but i'm not even sure you tell me what's how do we do this and then everyone goes and does their work and comes back and you're pretty much like in in many ways almost like a filter for the vision and you know so you, it's it's a reactive process and that's what I love about it because I don't feel like it's on my shoulders. It's on everyone else's and I just get to kind of take what they're doing and then help plug it into the overall vision. So that's what, um, in terms of why filmmaking, that's what attracts me the most. Um, and then in terms of documentary, um, so I've done one film so far, visual acoustics, and it happened to be a documentary because I think that was the best, um, genre or you know form slash format to tell this story but i'm working on some other projects that are that are narrative based and i don't just want to i mean right now i'm probably categorized as documentary filmmaker but i don't see myself that as that i see myself more as just as a storyteller and there's a lot of stories that i hope to have the opportunity to get to tell The first one was meeting Julius. So I was working, so I figured out that I didn't, I was waiting tables for many years. So I told you about the acting background, waiting tables for many years in Los Angeles and realized that I can't serve another plate of pasta or whatever it was. So I went into the family trade of art consultation and I experienced some relative success pretty quickly. And I had a project and I needed some 1930s black and white photographs of San Francisco. And it just so happened I met Julius's next door neighbor by chance. And her and I got to talking and she said, you should call, I didn't know who he was at the time. You should call my next door neighbor. His name is Julius Schulman. Here's his number. And he might be able to help you. So I called this number and he picked up the phone and said, Julius Schulman. And I told him what I wanted and he invited me up. And when he was alive, I used to tell people when I was on you know, the festival circuit doing Q and A's, I was, you know, would say, go ahead, crack open the Los Angeles white pages. And he's in there you know, he's the only Julius Shulman, call him up and he'll answer the phone and he'll say Julius Shulman and he'll invite you over. So he invited me over. And on that day, um, when I walked in the studio, he was still on the telephone and he kind of told me to come in and sit down in this little sitting area. And on that day, I was introduced to both the photography and to Julius. And I happened to pick up the Taschen book, Architecture and Its Photography. And I started flipping through these pages and I'm looking at these photographs and they just, as I've said before, they, they, they literally sang to me. I could hear, I could hear them. They had a lyrical quality. There's so much dimension. There was so much energy that was kind of just like, like, coming off the page and pulling me into these worlds. And they were extremely, right from the bat, I was like, wow, these are, these are cinematic. These should be up on the big screen. So there was that part. And then I was equally blown away by Julius as a person. And in LA, you know, I had kind of fallen into this, it's very easy to do with the energy there, this kind of frenetic pace of life. And Julius had this very zen, calming effect and he's kind of this I would say like this, this Zen Yoda master from a long time ago because he's a time traveler he comes from a whole other world 
And he always had time. That was the feeling with Julius. Everything was like, you know, downshifted like five or six, you know, degrees or what, you know. And so with him, I, we, we made a connection and he is the only person that's reminded me of my maternal grandfather. And I knew right away, I thought, gosh, I really like this guy. I'm going to become friends with him. And so I used to just go and visit him a lot and spend a lot of time. And we developed this friendship. And I met him in the spring of 99. And I proposed the idea for the movie to him towards the end of 2001. And I pretty much said, I said, hey, Julius, what do you think about a documentary on you and the photography and architecture? What do you think about me doing this documentary? And he said, his, his reply to me was, 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 well, I don't see why not. And that was it. So I started, started the film then. Uh, it was actually my New Year's resolution for 2002. I went to Circuit City. I bought a three chip Sony camera. And I said to myself, I'm going to go make this movie. 